You didn't have your backup line on, did you? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Goodness. Good morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. Father, that we're able to come and worship you and study your word and father as we study your word today about being born again we truly truly pray heavenly father that you will lead us in this study that we all learn from it as we uh, listen to you as through the leadership of the holy spirit heavenly father may we convey what it truly means to be born again and God we love you and thank you and ask for forgiveness of anything we may have said or done that is not pleasing in your sight it's our prayer in your name amen our lesson is born again by the spirit and our scripture is taken from John 3 we as Christians know that uh, the Holy Spirit brings into us new life as we place our trust in Jesus. And indeed, I know this older man was talking with a graduating high school senior, and he, he said, now what will you do now? And the uh, young man said, well, said, I probably will go to college. And he said, and then what? He said, well, I'll probably go to work. He said, and then what? And he just kept asking him for each phase that the, of life that the young man would face. And he said, and the older man would say, and then what? And so uh, the young man said simply, after the last, I don't know. Uh, so most of us get up, caught up with our lives, and oftentimes we wonder, well, what next? and then what we'll do rather than trust in Jesus for him to lead and to guide us in what he would have us do. And thank you, Lord, that you are our guide. And we know that the Holy Spirit brings into us new life as we place our faith and trust in him. And the first scripture that we have it's taken from John 3, the first three verses of John 3. And there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, Truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we know in studying the scripture and what we've read that the Pharisees, indeed, that they were a very religious party, were they not, in that century regarding Judaism and all. And, of course, by the public's uh, viewpoint, they were highly uh, recognized indeed and they were respected and these of course they also were the rulers of the synagogues and all 
And they were the largest religious party in that day and time. And uh, we know that they were considered separate ones because in this group, that's exactly what it meant. Um, Nicodemus, we know we've heard Nicodemus throughout our lives, have we not? We've studied about Nicodemus and all, and he was from the Pharisees. And this particular group, of course, uh, they were very influential uh, in Jewish life. They were the leaders, so to speak, in that day and time in Judaism. And they also prided themselves as being experts regarding any law. And, of course, they were staunch opponents of Jesus Christ. And they were questioning him. They condemned him for the various acts and the miracles that he performed and all. And they just, you know, could not understand that he was able to do what he did uh, in daily life. And so Jesus, you know, he, for a variety of things, included eating, uh, you know, they condemned him for the fact that he ate with the sinners, he mixed with the sinners, and they did not think that that went along, and they did not believe that that went along with the laws that they had. And because they felt like that he should not be doing these things. He should not be healing on the Sabbath day. And they did not understand all of that. But, you know, there was one thing about Nicodemus. He truly wanted to know more about Jesus and his relationship with God. And so, therefore, you know, he more or less prided himself uh, in trying to find out and have some kind of a connection with Jesus. And he was more or less an exception from his group of laws or rulers of the Jew. And we know that he, indeed, he was the leader of the Sanhedrin and all. And uh, the Pharisees, they were very, uh, they held in disdain what Jesus actually uh, was doing. And in other words, Jesus, Jesus didn't go to them and ask them or tell them what he was going to do. And they were therefore very upset about it. And, uh, you know, then Nicodemus, though, he prodded him more, asking him questions. And he was had a closer connection with him than the rest of his group. Uh, therefore, he really wanted to learn a little bit more about his teachings. And so, you know, also there was a question that Nicodemus also came to Jesus after dark and started uh, asking him questions. And so many of these scholars and all, they did not know what Nicodemus uh, was doing. Uh, but we know that after uh, the crucifixion, that Nicodemus participated with uh, Joseph Arimathea in burying the body of Jesus. So that uh, also tells us something that uh, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. And here Nicodemus uh, wanted to assist him in burying uh, Jesus. So we know that he had three powerful statements that, that he made because Nicodemus called Jesus rabbi. And they did not feel within their group uh, that was a title who uh, had, was a teacher of the law. And therefore, that was also a courteous and an humble phrase to refer to someone as a teacher of the law. And he also, he called Jesus a teacher that had come from God. We know that. In fact, he was a godly thing that God had his plan in his hand on the Son of God that he created. And indeed, he was carrying out the plan. He wasn't like us, like I mentioned the young man. You know, the older man was asking him what he was going to do next, what he was going to do next. But 
God has Jesus' plan worked out for him step by step. Uh, and while the Pharisees called him Jesus, they would not call him Jesus or teacher from God. So the Pharisees attributed uh, Jesus' ability uh, to drive out demons uh, because they said that he, that was a ruler of the demons being able to try to get demons out of uh, someone. And so Nicodemus, though, he saw what Jesus was doing. And he said that was something that was unlike what their uh, ruling was. And, but that Jesus was teaching, and he realized, uh, Nicodemus said, he realized that what Jesus was doing, that it was coming from God. Even though his rulers and the groups of Pharisees, they did not see that. They did not believe that. And he acknowledged that God was with him. So we don't know the conclusion on the signs that Jesus well, had performed. But we do know that if Nicodemus saw that what the miracle that God or Jesus was performing was as a result of God's direction in all, he knew that he had a close connection with God. He knew that he, what he was doing, that it was a certain thing that indeed it was coming uh, from there. And so Jesus certainly knew too that Nicodemus had a heart and that perhaps he went straight to the answer, you know, uh, before Nicodemus sometimes even had a chance to even ask the question. Jesus knew what he was thinking and what he was going to say, maybe what question he was going to ask him. And Jesus told him in this scripture, he's, uh, when they questioned him, that ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus, he said, uh, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that comes from God, for no one could perform these signs unless God was with him. And what did Jesus say? He said, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that is exactly what his answer was. It was very important for Jesus to tell Nicodemus, the only way that he could be, it was to see the kingdom of God was to be born again. So, uh, in other words, he was asking him, what must I do to get to heaven? And Jesus told him that you must be born again. And you know, some people today feel that they, their way to get to heaven is to do it by works by being a servant of good deeds and all. But that is not the way that we get to heaven. We know that indeed, that uh, even though Nicodemus assumed the follow that following the Jewish law was what was necessary for them to get to heaven, well, the rich young ruler asked Jesus what he must do to have eternal life. And he told him that he must be born again. And that's exactly what we have to do today to place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, ask for forgiveness of our sins, and to be born again. But born, being born is not something that we can do ourselves because Nicodemus thought, well, how can I be born again? I am out of my mother's womb, and I certainly cannot go back uh, into my mother's womb to be born again. But the new birth means that I have to become someone completely new. And receiving the new birth is something that can only come from God, placing our faith and trust in him. And, <clears throat> and the next scripture is um, verses four, 4 through 8. How can anyone be, in, be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I tell you that you must be born again. 
the wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And the key words in that is born of water. But that's not just a reference to water or baptism. And we know that that was in the Old Testament. But it, it uh, of course, it, this scripture is in the New Testament. But where water symbolized life, renewal, cleansing, salvation, and the Spirit. Nicodemus asked that question of, that all of us would probably ask. How do I do that? As I mentioned earlier, a few minutes ago, regarding that he knew he could not go back to his mother's womb and be born again. But uh, Jesus said, truly I tell you, and told Nicodemus that he must be born of water and the Spirit uh, to enter the kingdom of God. So we know that he, the water term has been understood in, in three different ways. Some believe that Jesus was referring to water baptism, that that would save. And I know that through the years, um, being closely connected with a relative, that they have emphasized baptism by water and going to heaven. But I think that some study further has changed their mind, but they still have not said that Jesus Christ saved them. But they mentioned having a relationship, but others have suggested that water is just a symbol of cleansing of the Holy Spirit. If this is true, then both words are referring to the same thing. But others believe that Jesus was referring to the watery fluid at physical birth. So whatever is born of the flesh, he said, is flesh. And whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. So that view, it, it does seem the best way for us to understand that that was Jesus' statement. So being born again is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the individual doesn't earn it. He accepts it by placing faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, two, being accepted into the family of God. So it's not by any way that we have earned it. We don't do it by good deeds. We will do good deeds after we have accepted the Lord as our Savior. Then we will let the world know and let God know that there has been a change in our life. And he wants us to be servants of him. Not for show, but to be a true witness for him. So we know indeed that naturally we can't just earn uh, our relationship with God in our way to heaven. The work of the Holy Spirit uh, has indeed uh, to bring us to the new birth. is not easy to measure and sometimes it's not as easy to explain, but you know, Jesus used that reference in the scripture I just read about wind to illustrate what was being born of the Holy Spirit is like because we experience the wind, but we don't know where it comes from other than through God. We see evidence of it. We can feel it blowing, can't we? And we, when it's going to be hot days like we've got coming up and like we have had a breeze really does feel good. And we know God is the one who's sending that breeze to help us. There's no doubt about it, though. But we also see evidence of leaves falling and leaves on the ground. And we're wishing that we could get out there and get rid of them. But we know that, indeed, that is an action of uh, God that Jesus was referencing. That even though we don't actually see where, where it comes from, we know that it is coming from God. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, in a person's life is that we don't necessarily, uh, it's not something that we can necessarily see, but it's no less real because the Spirit moves in us to draw us to God. And praise the Lord for that. I tell you, we ask for guidance day by day, so many times, asking the Holy Spirit to lead and direct us 
in whatever we do, whatever we say. So people often compare a newborn uh, infant with an adult family member. Some of them say when the newborn is born, oh, he looks just like Grandpa or Uncle Joe or whatever. And we know that, you know, seeing a brand new newborn sometimes is difficult to really say uh, who they may look like. And some people may say, well, he looks just like your dad or he looks like his mom or whatever, and the writer of this said, I think he looks like Yoda from Star Wars. And uh, I thought, you know, that's a pretty good reference for some people's opinion and all. But anyhow, we know that maybe a little later then we can see evidence of who they may resemble in the family and all, and even through their actions and all. So we can compare, uh, you know, that with the life of a newborn believer. Uh, regarding the work of the Holy Spirit. We know that as the, the child may grow and as we grow, that we see evidence and feel evidence of the Holy Spirit in our life and all. The call to be born of the Spirit is the same for us. Being good does not save us. Coming and going to church does not save us, but it's something that we are welcome to do. Is what we should be doing at all, worshiping him and serving him. And the next scripture that we have is uh, verses 14 through 17. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And for uh, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And we know the first scripture it mentioned, the snake in the wilderness. That was an image that uh, God commanded Moses uh, to make and mount on a pole uh, and he was using that as an illustration of God's judgment during the exodus and you might ask so if this is new birth what I need to do to go to heaven that cannot be achieved by as we've already mentioned by good works and it's not some ritual that we have to uh, perform in order to go to heaven it's by placing our faith and trust through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, asking for forgiveness, and seeking his way, and seeing a change. So Jesus answered that question uh, to Nicodemus, reminding him uh, of an event in the Jewish history that when the people of Israel, they were wandering around in the wilderness, and they began to blaspheme God and so what did God do he told Moses then uh, because of the sin in their life he picked up that point God told him to take that snake and to put it up on a post and uh, so we know that some of them they had all kind of snakes there and that they also were bitten some of them died uh, as a result of snake bites and all but the, the people realized they had sin in their life, and they repented, and they uh, also begged Moses to intercede to God for them. So Moses uh, explained the plan of salvation. Uh, of course, then we don't put reference to salvation, but he explained how they could get to heaven uh, indeed. And so God told Moses to uh, fashion a snake out of bronze, and to mount it up on a pole. And he said, anyone bit by a snake need only look at the bronze serpent, and he would be healed. But Jesus told Nicodemus in the same way. He said this, in the scripture, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. In John 3, 16, which we just quoted and read in John uh, 3, 17, that we do not do it on our own, that Jesus Christ, the
the Holy Spirit convicts our heart of our sin. So Jesus may intend both meanings here that uh, Jesus would be lifted up on the cross and Jesus would be exalted uh, when he was referencing uh, this to uh, Nicodemus about the fact that uh, what Moses did in the wilderness and also, you know, referencing people, uh, Peter told believers they should humble themselves to God. And so he was also illustrating how Jesus should be exalted the same way that Moses put that snake in a bronze upon a pole. And Jesus also would be exalted when he gave his life on the cross for each and every one of us because he was covering our sins. He did it for us. So we know that uh, today that people even worship snakes and all, but uh, we know that most of them, and I'm not going to get close to one. I don't want anyone around me. Uh, that's for certain. That's, I say that's the devil. That's the devil indeed. But I have a fear of them. But we know that uh, we die of uh, our natural death and we will only find the cure for, for going I mean for sins is by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior and Jesus said that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life eternal life and that is joy in our hearts and something for us to look forward to because we know indeed that when we die, we will go to heaven and we will be with him eternally along with our loved ones and along with Jesus. He said some people need to be convinced that Jesus died for uh, their sins, that he can be forgiven and that God has a place in heaven for him. And we do it by having faith and trust in Jesus and also entrust and commit our lives to him uh, because we know that the hands of Jesus Christ is upon us and leads and guides us. If we have to sh sweep the devil underneath many times, do we not? Because he is continuing. Joan made reference a while ago about the situation that the mission team faced. And she said, you know, the devil has a reason and there's a reason that this happened something's going to have he's going to have something good come from that incident or accident yesterday and to detain them keep them from going yesterday we don't know but we just pray and thank God that there were no injuries though but John 3.16 is the gospel in one verse. And the essential truth of how we can have eternal life is found in that verse. And we experience forgiveness of our sins. We experience the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. And for that, we are eternally grateful because it's forever and forever. And through the Spirit, we are made alive in Him. Heavenly Father, as we close the study of being born again and how the Holy Spirit leads and guides us day by day as a result of our acceptance in you many years ago. God, we have to ask for forgiveness from you day by day for something that has detained us or kept us from doing some work uh, for you. And we're so thankful that you took care of the mission team and we pray for your divine guidance as they travel now uh, to Mississippi. Heavenly Father, we pray for the safety going and coming, and we pray for the leadership of the Holy Spirit in whatever we do and whatever we say, and we pray for the ones who will be in our worship service uh, projecting their love for Christ and expressing through your holy word what you have to say for each and every one of us. Thank you, God, for watching over us day by day, every minute of the day. Thank you for eternal life that we have been assured of as acceptance, seeking forgiveness of our sins and obeying you. And we pray, God, for your leadership 
in every minute of every day. We love you and thank you again is our prayer. Amen.